guys. Thank you so much for being here with me tonight. In today's video, I'm going to be reading a very nostalgic book for me, and that is Chicken Soup for the Kid's Soul. I remember getting this book for either my birthday or Christmas or something like that, and just reading it over and over and over again because I just loved the stories that were in here and the messages and this is actually the original book that I had when I was a kid. It's in pretty good shape, especially for being read so many times. Um, I also have a new candle. I'm going to have to use two hands to hold it up because it is quite large. It is Golden Orchid with notes of tobacco flower and neroli. And I got it from Target. I also have a cup of ice cold water next to me. I just did a little bit of yoga and need to hydrate after that. Um, yoga with Adrian kind of kicked my butt, so, so I have that. And I think that is all I have to tell you guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you do enjoy this video, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. It would help me so much. And tap the notification bell so that you are notified whenever I post a video. And I post videos Saturdays and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So with all that out of the way, let's light this candle, have a sip of my water, and start reading Chicken Soup for the Kid's Soul. And for those of you who are curious, this book was written in 1998. So I was <clears throat> about seven or eight when this book came out. Book. Oh, look, it's a book. I'm sure it must be. A path of adventure is waiting for me. A yellow brick road to the Wizard of Oz. A frivol frivolous poem without any cause. Should I open it and peek to see what's inside? What if it's scary? I might need to hide. I'll never know unless I dare. I need a good laugh, a cry, or a scare. I'm sure it can wait. Well then, I'll never know. Maybe it's someplace that I'll never go. But today's the day that's been waiting for me. I'll open this book and I will see. And that was Jessica McCain that wrote that, and she was 14. To the kids of the world who needed these stories, we dedicate this book. We want to bring you hope, laughter, inspiration, and courage, and to let you know that you are not alone, especially to our kids, Christopher, Elizabeth, and Melanie. Marley and Weston, you are our heroes. And then here's a little cartoon that says, My teacher says I can grow up to be whatever I want to be. I want to be a kid.
on love. Some people say love is blind, but I think love is beautiful. Everything and everyone can feel love. Birds, humans, and animals, all living creatures. Love means caring and showing understanding. Love means being there when someone is in need. Love is being a friend. You can love your pets, your doll, your favorite chair, your friends and family. Love can be just about anything you want it to be. Love is a choice. That was by Stephanie Lee, who was age 11 when she wrote that. Kelly the Flying Angel Kelly and the Pony met when Kelly was seven. She had gone with her father to a neighbor's farm to buy seed. The shaggy brown and white pony stood alone in a pen. Kelly reached through the wires to touch the warm satin of the, po the pony's nose. Kelly spoke softly as the pony nuzzled Kelly's fingers. What's your name, pony? You seem so sad and lonely. She ain't got no name, the farmer grunt grunted. She ain't much good anymore. She's old and she's blind in one eye. I ain't got no use for her since the kids are gone. He turned back to Kelly's father, who had loaded the bags of seed onto the truck and pulled crumpled bills from his pocket. You can have her if you pay me something for the saddle. How much? Her father inquired, barely glancing at the pony. Twenty. The old man reached a calloused hand toward the money. Kelly's father pulled off another bill. Gnarled fingers snatched the bills and stuffed them quickly into the pocket of well-worn, dirty overalls. Kelly cradled the brittle, or the brittle in her arms as they drove home, her excitement mounting. She kept peeking into the rear of the truck to reassure herself that the pony was still there. Now, this pony will be your job. You have to feed her and take care of her. It'll teach you some responsibility. I don't have time to mess with her. Understand? Her father's voice was stern. I'll do it, Daddy. Thank you for letting me have her. I promise I'll take good care of her. Once they were home and the pony was safely in the stall, Kelly threw hay into the manger, then ran to the house. Mom, you should see our pony. She was so lonely, but she'll be happy here. Joy sparkled in Kelly's eyes. I've named her Trixie, because I'm going to teach her how to do tricks. Before her mother could respond, Kelly was back out the door to see that Trixie was comfortable. It was then that Kelly introduced Trixie to her angel. When Kelly was a small child, she had been awakened by a frightening storm. She called to her mother, who reassured her by telling her, Don't be afraid. Jesus sends his angels to protect little children. From then on, Kelly had never actually seen an angel, but she felt a presence at times when she would otherwise have been afraid or lonely. Kelly brushed the pony's coat and trimmed her mane and hoofs. Trixie responded to the attention by nuzzling Kelly's neck, searching her pockets for treats, and following her commands. As Kelly rode from the house to the back pasture, she taught Trixie how to raise the latches on the gates with her nose. The gates would swing open and Kelly would close them without dismounting. Kelly taught Trixie a routine, trying to duplicate tricks that she had seen at the circus. She rode standing up and even and eventually mastered the ultimate stunt of jumping through a crudely constructed hoop on each circuit of the riding ring. Kelly and Trixie became the best of friends. When Kelly was 10, her parents divorced. Kelly and her dog Laddie moved with her mom to a small farm several miles away. The problems between her parents kept Kelly from seeing her father anymore. And because Trixie still lived at her father's farm, Kelly was doubly miserable. On the day they left for her father on the day that they left her father's farm, Kelly walked slowly to the pasture to say goodbye to Trixie. 
she had never needed her angel's help more. Angel, she sobbed, please stay with Trixie so she won't be lonely. I have Mom and Laddie, but Trixie will be all alone. She needs you. With her small arms around Trixie's neck, she reassured the pony. It'll be all right, Trixie. My angel will take care of you. Her parents' divorce, a new school, a different home, and the loss of Trixie turned Kelly's life upside down all at once. Her mother encouraged her to make friends. Come on, Kelly, and ride with us, two of her schoolmates urged as they sat on their bicycles in the driveway. Following the two girls down the road, Kelly felt the wind in her hair and the warmth of the sun on her face. She needed friends, she reminded herself, and pedaled faster to catch up. During the summer, Kelly and her friends rode their bicycles to the park and around the track of the school. With her strong legs, she could match any of them when they raced. After racing on the track one sunny day, Kelly pedaled home with her new friends. As she bounced along the bumpy, dusty road, the hard, hard edge of the bike dug into her leg. She wished she were sitting in her smooth leather saddle on Trixie, gliding over the fresh green grass of the pasture. Suddenly, the front wheel of the bicycle swerved into a rut. She turned hard to the left to get it out, but it was too late. Hurtling over the handlebars, she bounced off the edge of the road and into a ditch. The girls hurried to her. Her injuries are minor, the doctor informed her mother after Kelly had limped home, but you better let her keep her quiet for a couple of days. Though sore and scratched, Kelly returned to her bicycle in a few days. One morning, she awoke with a numb feeling in her legs. Slowly, she slid her body to the edge of the bed, but as she attempted to stand, she collapsed on the floor. Puzzled by this development, the doctor examined her carefully. Her injuries have healed, but there is some psychological trauma, he said. I've scheduled therapy and stretching exercises could help. Kelly went home in a wheelchair. As she sat on the porch, she hugged Laddie close and stared wistfully across the field. Please, God, please bring Trixie and my angel back to me. I need them so. One day, a letter came from Kelly's father. Dear Kelly, your aunt told me about your accident. I'm sorry to hear about it. I have made arrangements to have your pony delivered to you next week. She has been opening all the gates and letting my stock out of the pasture. I think she is looking for you. Maybe having her will make you feel better. Love, Dad. In a few days, a truck arrived, and Trixie was led down the ramp. Nuzzling Kelly's neck and snorting at Laddie, the pony checked out her new home. Kelly petted Trixie's head and neck as far as she could reach from her wheelchair and kissed her on the nose. Trixie, Trixie, I knew you would come. Thank you, thank you. Kelly awoke the next morning with renewed determination. She wheeled herself to the barnyard with a treat for Trixie. Grasping Trixie's mane, she pulled herself up from the wheelchair and stood beside the pony. Stretching to reach Trixie's back, she brushed her until the pony's coat shone. Kelly's legs grew stronger each day. Then, eager to ride, she climbed up the wooden fence and struggled to pull herself onto the pony's back. Trixie's coat was warm and silky against Kelly's bare legs. Look, I'm riding, I'm riding, Kelly yelled as Trixie's slow trot bounced her up and down like a rag doll. Go, Trixie. Kelly dug her heels into the pony's sides and they raced through the gate to the open pasture. Kelly squealed with delight, and Laddie ran after them, barking wildly. When school started, an enthusiastic Kelly sprang onto the bus with a cheerful greeting. No more wheelchair for her. At home, a poster of, cir of a circus hung in Kelly's room. It showed a smiling angel. 
In Kelly's bold, colorful printing, it read, Kelly, the Flying Angel, shows nightly and weekends. And that was by Louise R. Ham. Let me take a sip of water. The Tower. <clears throat> and then it has two quotes. After the verb to love, to help, is the most beautiful verb in the world. Am I my brother's keeper? Absolutely. Ten-year-old John McNeil ran barefoot out the door on a windy, cold day in February and headed straight for the 125-foot electrical tower behind the McNeil home. John didn't realize the dangers of the structure, which carries power from Hoover, from the Hoover Dam to the southern Arizona communities. He didn't know that it carried 230,000 sizzling volts through its silver wires. He wasn't even aware that he had forgotten his shoes. John suffers from autism, a condition that separates him from reality, forcing him to live within his own thoughts. That day, his thoughts were set on climbing to the top of the tower, touching the sky, and feeling what it's like to fly. He had scaled the gigantic jungle gym before, but he had never gotten beyond the 20-foot handrails. His 17-year-old brother, James, was always watching and close by. James was always sure that no harm came to his little brother. But today was different. Today, John ran out the door unnoticed before James realized that he was missing. John had already cleared the handrails and was making his way to the sky by the time James spotted his brother. John, like most autistic children, had absolutely no fear or concept of danger. James, on the other hand, realized that he had to face his greatest fear of all, the fear of heights. James understood the danger of the electrical tower, but chose to follow his younger brother up each gray rail trying not to look down, all the way to the top. James finally reached his brother and held him tightly with his right hand. With his left hand, he gripped a metal bar to help stabilize them both. James was shaking. He was cold and scared, but he never released his grip on John. John struggled, wanting to fly, but James held tight. James's hands were numb, and he was afraid that if he let go, they would both fall to their death. The minutes stretched into hours as they balanced on a three-inch rail. James sang hymns to soothe his own racing heart and to distract his brother from the rescue action taking place below. Hundreds of, pe hundreds of people gathered at the base of the tower. They looked like ants to James, who saw them from high atop his perch. Noisy news helicopters began to circle, sending images of the two boys clinging to the lower, clinging to the tower against a bright blue sky to millions of television sets nationwide. Fire trucks and other emergency vehicles rushed to the scene. One brave firefighter from the technical rescue squad climbed up the structure to where the two brothers hung on for their lives. He quickly tied them securely to a mud a metal beam. Part of the equipment needed to rescue James and John was a highly specialized truck called a Condor. Luckily, one was located at a nearby construction site. The rescuers patiently awaited its arrival, and at last, it was spotted moving along the road leading toward the tower. Once positioned, a platform was raised from the truck up to the boys sitting on the top of on the top rail of the tower. Secured with a safety mine, the brothers and their rescuers were then carefully lowered to the ground as the crowd below cheered and applauded. People were telling James that he was a hero, but James didn't have any time for their praise. He wanted to be at his brother's side while they transported John to the hospital to be treated for exposure to the cold. 
Not all guardian angels have feathered wings and golden halos. Most would not be recognized. Yet, on a windy, cold day, hundreds of people caught their first and maybe only glimpse of one, a 17-year-old guardian angel named James. And that was written by Robert J. Fern. Uncle Charlie, where there is great love, there are always miracles. I remember being scared the first time I saw Uncle Charlie. I had just stepped off the school bus and coming into the house from the brightness of day, I couldn't see. When my eyes adjusted, I was surprised to see a bed in the dining room. A strange, unshaven man, propped up by pillows, sat in the darkened room. For a second, I wondered whether I was in the wrong house. Patty, is that you? My grandmother called from the other room. I bolted into the kitchen. Nana, who's that man? Remember me telling you about Charlie, about how sick he got in the war, and how they put him in the veterans hospital. Well, that man in there is your Uncle Charlie. The silent man in the dining room didn't look anything like the smiling photograph on the mantel. Last night, Patty, I had a dream, my grandmother said. In the dream, God spoke. He said, go get your son, bring him home, and he'll get well. That's what I did. This morning after you went to school, I took the city bus to the hospital. I walked right into that place, into Charlie's room, took him by the hand, and said, I'm taking you home. Nana chuckled. Good heavens, how we must have looked. Charging down that big old hospital lawn, him in that gown, open and flapping in the back. Nobody stopped us, but nobody said a word. Even when we got on the bus, she paused. It was like we were invisible. Nana, Charlie didn't look like he saw me. Maybe I'm invisible too. Charlie saw you. It's just that he's got what the doctors call catatonic. Guess that's their fancy way of saying cat's got his tongue. She stopped rocking. Don't you worry now. Charlie will be talking. He just needs to know we love him, that he's home. Frightened by the dark beyond the open kitchen door, I ran out the back door, leaped, on, leaped off the porch, and raced across the field slapping my hips, pretending I was both horse and rider. For months, I avoided the dining room. Finally, I became accustomed to Charlie's silence. After that, I played in Charlie's room. His blanket-covered knees were the towers of my castles. Charlie, you awake? I whispered. Today at school, I saw a picture of an enchanted prince in my teacher's book. He's got long hair, just like you. Dust sparkled in the shaft of light, streaming in under the, dawn, under the drawn shade. I grabbed at the sparkles, making the dust whirl. Look, Charlie, I've caught up us a handful of sun. It's got millions and billions of tiny stars in it. I held out my fist. I've caught some for you. Patty, I've got something for you, Nana called from outside. Before leaving Charlie, I put my favorite doll with its red nail, red nail polished lips and half bald head next to him and tucked them both in. She's a princess. I'm leaving her to keep you company. I found this little bird under the old oak, Nana said. Its eyes are still closed. It must have just pecked out of its shell. There's a dropper in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Use that dropper to feed him ground up sunflower seeds and water. She handed me the bird. Empty out a shoebox and be sure to put something soft in for a lining. What are you going to name him? Little Bird. I'm calling him Little Bird, just like in the song. I went inside and dumped the shoebox with my rock collection on the ring on the rug. Hey Charlie, look what I've got. I put a little bird in the empty box. Watch him for a minute. I've got to get the dropper. I put the box in Charlie's lap. 
When I returned with the dropper, the box was lying on the floor, empty. Charlie had dropped him. Charlie, I whispered, trying not to cry. Where is Little Bird? Cracking open his cupped hands, Charlie smiled as he stared down at the tiny, hunger-stretched beak that peeked up between his thumbs and his forefingers. That evening, when I was mashing potatoes, I said, You know what, Nana? Charlie's taking care of the little bird. I know it. I saw him. And you know something else? He's making humming noises, like he's singing. Nana was getting Charlie's tray ready when Charlie walked into the kitchen and sat down at the table. He was dressed in overalls and a plaid shirt. It was the first time I'd seen him in anything other than pajamas. Nana opened her eyes in exaggerated surprise. She looked so silly, I started to laugh. Then Charlie made the first sound, other than snoring and coughing, that I'd ever heard him make. He laughed. Slapping his knees, he laughed until the trees ran until the tears ran down his cheeks. Then he reached into the big pocket of his overalls and took out Little Bird. Look, he said. Isn't this the sweetest, most helpless little thing you ever saw? Nana almost fell out of her chair. Then she started to cry. I wasn't surprised because I knew that even though he'd been placed under a spell, the spell couldn't last. They never do. The Game of Love. Love is something eternal. Vincent Van Gogh. Dad brought him home from a fishing trip in the mountains, full of cockle birds and so thin you can count every rib. Good gracious, Mom said. He's filthy. No, he isn't. He's rusty, said John, my eight-year-old brother. Can we keep him? Please, please, please. He's going to be a big dog, Dad warned, lifting a mud-encrusted paw. Probably why he was abandoned. What kind of dog, I asked. It was impossible to get close to this smelly creature. Mostly German Shepherd, Dad said. He's in bad shape, John. He may, he may not make it. John was gently picking out cockleburrs. I'll take care of Rusty. Honest, I will. Mom gave in, as she usually did with John. My little brother had a mild form of hemophilia. Four years earlier, he'd almost bled to death from a routine tonsillectomy. We've all been careful with him since then. All right, John, Dad said. We'll keep Rusty, but he's your responsibility. Deal. And that's how Rusty came to live with us. He was John's dog from that very first moment though he tolerated the rest of us. John kept his word. He fed, watered, medicated, and groomed the scuffy-looking animal every day. I think he liked taking care of something rather than being taken care of. Over the summer, Rusty grew into a big, handsome dog. He and John were constant companions. Wherever John went, Rusty was by his side. When school began, Rusty would walk John the six blocks to elementary school, then come home. Every school day at three o'clock, rain or shine, Rusty would wait for John at the playground. There goes Rusty, the neighbors would say. Must be close to three. You can set your watch by that dog. Telling time wasn't the only amazing thing about Rusty. Somehow, he sensed that John shouldn't roughhouse like the other boys. He was very protective. When the neighborhood bully taunted my undersized brother, Rusty's hackles rose, and a deep, menacing growl came from his throat. The heckling ceased after one encounter. And when John and his best friend Bobby wrestled, Rusty monitored their play with a watchful eye. If John were on top, fine. If Bobby got John down, Rusty would lope over, grab Bobby's collar, and pull him off. Bobby and John thought this game was great fun. They staged fights quite often, 
much to mother's dismay. You're going to get hurt, John, she would scold, and you aren't being fair to Rusty. John didn't like being restricted. He hated being careful, being different. It's just a game, Mom. Shoot, even Rusty knows that, don't you, boy? Rusty would cock his head and give John a happy smile. In the spring, John got an afternoon paper route. He'd come home from school, fold his papers, and take off on his bike to deliver them. He always took the same streets in the same order. Of course, Rusty delivered papers too. One day, for no particular reason, John changed his route. Instead of turning left on the street as he usually did, he turned right. Thump. Crash. A screech of brakes. Rusty sailed through the air. Someone called us about the accident. I had to pry John from Rusty's lifeless body so that Dad could bring Rusty home. It's my fault, John said over and over. Rusty thought the car was going to hit me. He thought it was another game. The only thing Rusty was playing was the game of love, Dad said. You both played it well. John sniffled. Huh? You were there for Rusty when he needed you. He was there for you when he thought you needed him. That's the game of love. I want him back, John wailed. My Rusty's gone. No, he isn't, Dad said, hugging John and me. Rusty will stay in your memories forever. And he has. And here's a little cartoon. It says, Dad, I want a bedtime story. I'm busy, Calvin. I'll read you one tomorrow. If you don't read me a story, I won't go to bed. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Calvin who always wanted things his way. One day, his, his dad got sick of it and locked him in the basement for the rest of his life. Everyone else lived happily ever after. The end. I don't like these stories with morals. Where's my kiss then? There was once a little girl named Cindy. Cindy's father worked six days a week and often came home tired from the office. Her mother worked equally hard, doing the cleaning, the cooking, and the many tasks needed to run a family. Theirs was a good family, living a good life. Only one thing was missing, but Cindy didn't even realize it. One day, when she was nine, she went on her first sleepover. She stayed with her friend, Debbie. At bedtime, Debbie's mother tucked the girls into bed. She kissed them both goodnight. Love you, said Debbie's mother. Love you too, murmured Debbie. Cindy was so amazed that she couldn't sleep. No one had ever kissed her goodnight. No one had ever kissed her at all. No one had ever told her that they loved her. All night long, she lay there thinking over and over, this is the way it should be. When she went home, her parents seemed pleased to see her. Did you have fun at Debbie's house? asked her mother. That house, that house felt awfully quiet without you, said her father. Cindy didn't answer. She ran up to her room. She hated them both. Why had they never kissed her? Why had they never hugged her or told her that they loved her? Didn't they love her? She wished she could run away. She wished she could live with Debbie's mother. Maybe there had been a mistake, and, th and these weren't her real parents. Maybe Debbie's mother was her real mother. That night before bed, she went to her parents. Well, good night then, she said. Her father looked up from his paper. Good night, he said. Her mother put down her sewing and smiled. Good night, Cindy. No one made a move. Cindy couldn't stand it any longer. Why don't you ever kiss me? She asked. Her mother looked flustered. Well, she stammered, because, I guess, because no one ever kissed me when I was little. That's just the way it was. 
Cindy cried herself to sleep. For many days, she was angry. Finally, she decided to run away. She would go to Debbie's house and live with them. She would never go back to the parents who didn't love her. She packed her backpack and left without a word. But once she got to Debbie's house, she couldn't go in. She decided that no one would believe her. No one would let her live with Debbie's parents. She gave up her plan and walked away. Everything felt bleak and hopeless and awful. She would never have a family like Debbie's. She was stuck forever with the worst, most loveless parents in the world. Instead of going home, she went to a park and sat on a park bench. She sat there for a long time, thinking, until it grew dark. All of a sudden, she saw the way. This plan would work. She would make it work. When she walked into her house, her father was on the phone. He hung up immediately. Her mother was sitting with an anxious expression on her face. The moment Cindy walked in, her mother called out, Where have you been? We've been worried to death. Cindy didn't answer. Instead, she walked up to her mother, gave her a kiss on the cheek, and said, I love you, Mom. Her mother was so startled that she couldn't speak. Cindy marched up to her dad. She gave him a hug. Good night, Dad, she said. I love you. And then she went to bed, leaving her speechless parents in the kitchen. The next morning, when she came down to breakfast, she gave her mother a kiss. She gave her father a kiss. At the bus stop, she stood on tiptoe and kissed her mother. Bye, Mom, she said. I love you. And that's what Cindy did every day of every week for every month. Sometimes her parents drew back from her, stiff and awkward. Sometimes they laughed about it, but they never returned the kiss. But Cindy didn't stop. She had made her plan. She kept right at it. Then, one evening, she forgot to kiss her mother before bed. A short time later, the door to her room opened. Her mother came in. Where's my kiss then? She asked, pretending to be cross. Cindy sat up. Oh, I forgot, she said. She kissed her mother. I love you, Mom. She lay down again. Good night, she said and closed her eyes. But her mother didn't leave. Finally, she spoke. I love you too, her mother said. Then her mother bent down and kissed Cindy right on the cheek. And don't ever forget my kiss again, she said, pretending to be stern. Cindy laughed. I won't, she said, and she didn't. Many years later, Cindy had a child of her own, and she kissed that baby until, as she put it, her little cheeks were red. And every time she went home, the first thing her mother would say to her was, Where's my kiss then? And when it was time to leave, she'd say, I love you. You know that, don't you? Yes, Mom, Cindy would say. I've always known that. And that was written by M.A. Urquhart. And it said it was adapted from Ann Lander's column. And that is where I'm going to stop today. I hope that you enjoyed this book. It was definitely a walk down memory lane for me. And I would love to continue reading it. If you guys would enjoy that, please let me know in the comments. I hope that this relaxed you and that you are ready for a beautiful night's sleep. If you liked this video, please like it and subscribe to my channel and have a beautiful night.